Before the internet, the only way to get new info on new games coming out was through gaming magazines. I'm sure everyone has their memories of stuff like Nintendo Power and EGM, but today I want to narrow the focus down to something much, much smaller. Before we get to that though, I want to talk about my history with gaming magazines so people can understand why I ended up reading the UK-based magazine that this video is about. Here in the Netherlands, we had several small gaming magazines in Dutch. Now, I'm not sure what the production of them was like at the time, since that info doesn't seem to be available, so I can only relate my experience with them as a reader, but the main one that I read for the longest time growing up kind of sucked, especially looking back at it. Power Unlimited was, and still is, the biggest magazine here in the Netherlands. Their coverage mostly focused on their own egos rather than the games themselves. Articles about previews for upcoming releases turned into travel blogs, the news section was littered with personal stories of events that happened to them, and eventually they started having a TV show of their own, as well as conventions in their own name. It was clear the focus of the magazine was the people behind it, and not so much the games they were covering, and because of that, a lot of their reviews weren't that good at describing the games. Reviews often basically were just a joke with a score attached to it, and screenshots for the games that you were interested in were basically non-existent. Existent. So during the generational leap towards the Nintendo 64 and the PlayStation 1, I joined in on the Nintendo side of things. A lot of things were changing at the same time back then. For one, I was starting to have money that I could spend for myself as an allowance. Besides this, my English got to the point where I could understand it easily. I'm not sure exactly when it got to this point since I mostly just learned English through cartoons and video games. All the cool kids shows that I liked as a kid were in English and when we started getting Cartoon Network as a channel here, we didn't get our own version of it. We started getting the UK version of Cartoon Network with no subtitles. Immersion was always there, so when I learned to read and could follow subtitles for regular programming and read the text that was in video games, I could understand English on my own just fine within maybe a year of that happening. Wanting to put this to the test and looking for a new magazine in general, I found my way towards Nintendo Official Magazine. I recently wanted to go back to read this magazine and I thought it would be nice to relive the nostalgia of those days on video, but I wasn't prepared for what I ended up seeing. Reading old Nintendo Official Magazines is such a precious time capsule that highlights so many signs of the time that I decided to extend the video of reading one or two issues to a larger video showcasing some highlights of four and a half Half years worth of issues. So with all of this preamble out of the way, let's start reading. Nintendo Official Magazine started off its life as the Nintendo Magazine System during the transition of the NES to the SNES. Basically, it was one of the bigger magazines during the high point of Nintendo's releases. Unfortunately, it also happened to be a UK-based magazine where Nintendo quite caught on as well as it did in the US or some parts of Europe. Hi, Rick Mail here. I don't know if you're like me, Immensely rich, talented, handsome. Isn't it a bore? Well, I found the answer. Zelda Link's Awakening from Nintendo. You play a medieval elf named Link. You travel through many worlds, meeting endless characters on your eternal adventures. So hey, next time you're Rick Mail, why not try? Zelda Link's Awakening. I think you'll like it. To coincide with the release of the Nintendo 64, they did a major rebranding, changing their name, appearance, and format. That in itself isn't too bad, but that change also coincided with the rise of 90s attitude and console wars being injected heavily into the magazine. To make matters worse, if you thought the Nintendo 64 library was built up at a glacial speed in the US, game releases back then tended to be fewer and longer away in, than in Europe in most cases. Not just for Nintendo, but for every system that wasn't a PC. So a lot of the magazine was spent attempting to pad the issue length because there wasn't that much to fill the pages with. So to give a good idea of what the magazine was like, let's quickly run down the format, both in the shape it was when the Nintendo 64 library was in shambles and the redesign they gave it when games actually started to come out. Captain, there's something heading our way extremely fast. It's coming straight at us. I've never seen anything like it before. Action. Racing. Fun. Adventure. Nintendo 64, the fastest, most powerful games console on Earth. Now at 99.99. 
The Nintendo official magazine basically followed this same format for most of it. You had the cover, advertisements, then they'd go straight into the news, covering a lot of stuff that in most cases ended up just not happening, which is kind of a shame, but that was a sign of the time. Then you start going into the news relating to games that are coming out very soon, then more ads, more news that is likely not going to happen or is going to happen very, very late into the system's life. A list of games that have been released so far and their scores, the reviews that are coming up, a contest where you can win games by sending in your scores, cheats and guides for games that have only just released. So if you're looking forward to these games and you haven't picked them up within a month, prepare for spoilers because they're going to give away everything. A retro look at older titles because they had to fill pages, another high score show, more ads, the actual reviews that the magazine is actually about, usually with a shit ton of screen caps of everything, giving away way too much information for most games, but we'll get back to that later. More ads, Previews for games that aren't out yet, where they tend to hype them up even though they even look bad. A letter section that is basically one big console generation flame war. And then they start looking into games that might be coming out in the future. More ads and uh, another ad. Yeah, there were a lot of ads, but that was kind of typical for the time. But as you can see, most of the magazine is kind of just aiming at padding the length of it. They did end up doing a redesign later, and well, let's just look at that now. I actually like this redesign a lot. It's a lot cleaner and it's a lot easier on the eyes, but one of the problems is still going to remain. And well, you'll see. So the redesign opened up with the people who are working on the magazine, the big cover game, they usually gave them several pages and they tended to focus on using the CG art a lot more often, basically just focusing on the promotional art to really sell the game and then having screenshots besides that. Then they go into reviews where they basically still follow the same format, except these are actually games that are out, so they're reviewing them. This is more in line with typical game magazines. Though what I especially like with the uh, redesign is that everything looks a lot cleaner, pages are a lot more easier to read, information is way easier to access, but they're still spoiling the shit out of everything before it's even time for it. They also started having more pages to actually show the releases that have come out so far and all the scores that they've given. Though these are also really cramped with ads if you really pay attention to it. Plus it's clear that the games that they gave higher scores are being given more time to basically just pat this entire section out. It's pretty clever, honestly, like I cannot fault them for doing this. And as a kid I always really liked all the screen caps of the controllers and the memory cards and stuff like that. I always wanted all of them even though the magazine is basically bashing them. After that you get to the tips and tricks section that every game magazine had to have at that time. Then they'd give these super long guides that would usually spoil most games within like a month of release. It was ridiculous, like full on screen cups of everything. More ads, of course. And then the new Club Mario where, well, it looks nicer. Uh, they still console bash a lot, but we'll get to that. Then they go into the news where they hype up upcoming releases. Most of them are usually shit. They ended up steering me the wrong direction so many times. Like here they are glorifying Buck Bumble as something that's actually going to be worth picking up. What about now? It's time to rock with the big the Buck Bumble. And at this point, almost every month they'd have at least two or four pages to The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, though can you really blame them? But yeah, they showcase a lot of mediocre trash. I kind of didn't show too many of the ads here because I already showed them last time and there's not much more point. Plus the ads in this issue weren't that interesting to begin with. So let's actually get into the interesting stuff with this magazine because oh boy did a lot of this not age well. Though there is some interesting stuff that I also want to talk about but we're gonna get to some of the sleazy stuff first. Nintendo Official Magazine had this tendency to bash all the competition in a very direct manner and it's interesting to see because, well, it's an official magazine. They called the PlayStation the Grey Station, or 
to be accurate, the phony gray station, they would bash most games that they'd come across and they had this weird thing where it's like, oh yeah, this game sucks because it's on PlayStation and then later they glorify it like, look, it's being freed from the shackles of Sony gray station. Isn't that great? We're finally getting this. At one point they ran a monthly rumor about how Resident Evil was going to come to Nintendo 64 and how great this was, even though most of the time they mentioned the series, they bashed it because it's not on Nintendo 64. They loved showcasing art from fans of basically other systems being decapitated or destroyed. They had a hard on for any sort of console warrior stuff and I think the greatest highlight of this is the moment where they basically glorify Castlevania 64 because it's in 3D and Symphony of the Night is gonna suck according to them, which is something that is not just hilarious in hindsight, I posted this on Twitter and it got a huge response, but the real interesting thing is that um, Castlevania 64 was never considered a good game. It was critically panned, it was panned by the audiences, and it's, it's awful. And Symphony of the Night has always been respected as one of the better games. A few magazines attacked it for being 2D, but overall, it is considered a classic and it was almost immediately considered that. Castlevania 64 was so bad that within the year, Konami re-released the game with more bug fixes and features and basically tried to get people's money a second time from the same game. This magazine pretended that the game was good and then when the sequel was going to start rolling around, they started to say that it was bad and this new version was going to be good. This was something that the magazine did a lot. They build up upcoming releases only to then tear the same game down in favor of the upcoming game. It was really fucking weird. And speaking of rolling on, that was a phrase that they used for RPGs, which is the weirdest thing. For a long period, anytime they talk about RPGs, they try to use rolling on or rolling in as a thing for it, and it didn't make any sense. There was also a weird undercurrent where they basically attacked RPGs because it was becoming very clear that the Nintendo 64 didn't get any RPGs worth playing, while the PlayStation had it as one of its biggest strengths. Even here in Europe, where we usually don't get RPGs, they were starting to release on Sony's system and not on Nintendo 64. Though the absolute second that Nintendo started to get one RPG, they praised the ever-loving fuck out of it, because finally we have a real one too. And yeah, they reviewed Quest 64 positively. Though here in Europe it's called Holy Magic Century. Still though, <laughs> they, they actually praised Holy Magic Century. It's unbelievable. Hi, I'm Nigel Mansell, and you know, I'm not the type of guy who buys his family presents that he really wants for himself. That's why I bought my wife Nigel Mansell's World Championship game from Nintendo. You have to choose the right tyres, pit stop, and race against the best drivers in the world. It's just like the real thing, and my wife loves it. Right, darling? Hi, it's uh, very realistic, Nigel. My little girls love it too. Right, twins? Not Completely off, true. Hey, even my dog loves it. Right, Fang? Woof. So! There you have it. I think it's a wonderful game, and if your family's anything like mine, they'll love it too, right, girls? Right, Nigel Mansell, Nintendo, Nintendo, Nintendo. Holy Magic Century wasn't the only time that they they really sold me on something truly awful. This magazine had a tendency to build up a lot of games just for the fact that they were on the Nintendo 64. And because of them, I ended up playing so many games that were absolutely not worth the time, sometimes even going so far as to buy them and just regretting it. Because of them, I bought Mission Impossible and I've rented Buck Bumble, South Park Rally, the South Park 64 game, Body Harvest, Shadow Man, and so many other games. I think at one point I even bought Castlevania 64 and I traded it. Uh, I think I traded it for a copy of International Superstar Soccer 64. I don't even like sports games, I don't like soccer, and I like International Superstar Soccer a lot more than I do Castlevania 64. And this is coming from someone who likes Castlevania. That is how bad it was. And at this time, I didn't even know that Castlevania Symphony of the Night existed. So that should really put things into perspective of how bad it was. Incredible! Everything. Though not everything they did was bad, they had this section that I actually really enjoyed that was called Ultimate Warrior, and even looking back at it I can still see the fun of this. Basically they let kids send in their Ultimate Warrior, basically this weird Frankenstein 
monster based on characters from other video games. Uh, basically picking a head, a body, and legs, and just justifying why this would make this character so much stronger than just one of these characters. And then they get one of their staff people to just Photoshop this thing together and just make something out of it. And it, I don't know, these results are just really funny to watch, even to this day. I can really respect stuff like this. You know, I make stupid, dumb Photoshop stuff, and uh, maybe this was an inspiration for that. I don't know. Though, besides this, they had a section that they called Hammer Time, which uh, was one of the reasons that I actually wanted to go back to read this magazine. Hammer Time was a section wherein, basically, they sent out prizes for you demolishing your PlayStations or your Sega systems, and they really loved this. They even went so far as to defend it when people sent in angry messages in the mail section, like, dude, this is so childish and petty, why are you doing this? I think a few times they even reused the same consoles and the same pictures and pretended that this was a newly smashed system. It's not a section that lasted that long. As far as I know, they've done this eight times and then they stopped. I might be missing issues and it might have happened more, but that's as much as I know. It is still incredibly awful though. on Nintendo's enormous star, brilliant, cut to wide shot of star, followed by lingering tracking shot of star's best side, and finally, freeze on enormous close-up of the star that everybody is talking about! Total entertainment. Let's record it. What? Uh, oh, no! Oh, the wrong idea! Yes, Game Boy, an interesting incentive Nintendo. One of the reasons that I gravitated to this magazine was this was a pre-internet era, so screenshots and videos were not that easy to find, so you basically depended on these magazines to provide this stuff for you. Now, a lot of magazines didn't give enough screenshots, and I ended up gravitating towards Nintendo Official Magazine because they gave so many screenshots. The only problem is, they gave too many screenshots. A lot of times their reviews would outright give away all the stages and all the weapons and basically not have any surprises left for you if you picked up the game after reading their review. Within months of a game coming out, they do a full guide with constant images to show you where everything is, what everything looks like, and how to do everything. Often before a game even came out, you'd have the preview section and it would just show everything that is in the, in the entire game. At one point in the new section, they basically just ran through the entire first dungeon in Ocarina of Time. It is actually the moment that I ended up dropping this magazine, because this is when I noticed that I was kind of spoiled on way too much information that I'd rather have figured out for myself when I got Ocarina of Time in my own hands. And I got my release a day before it actually came out, so I was ahead of the curve and still I had all of this spoiled to me by an official magazine. And that sucks. Though, to be completely fair, I understand why they would have to use so many screenshots. This is the full list of the games that had come out up to this point in the magazine's life. This magazine happened about 9 months into the Nintendo 64's life cycle, meaning that after 9 months, almost no games had come out for the system. The PlayStation 2 launched with about this many games, if I recall correctly. That is just awful. And I can't imagine how hard it must be to design a magazine monthly for a system that most months sees maybe one or two games coming out, and has news coming out for games sometimes, and usually has news coming out for games that aren't coming out to your system, but might come out. Stuff like this is rough. At one point they ended up just covering Dead or Alive, even though Dead or Alive hadn't been announced for the system, just because there just was nothing else to really cover at the time, and that's just sad. Down with Zelda from the very start. I got the heart, it's Mars to play the part. Down with Zelda. Peeping through, it's been overhead view. Cause a man's gotta do what a man's gotta do. So I stay on track, collect the facts. Never cut the slack, and I always watch my back for Jack. Down with Zelda. Yeah. Soon as then, I'm the man with the plan. Cause the power's in my head, and the power's in my hand. Down with Zelda. 
Then there's also stuff like this, where I'm actually wondering if there's any other confirmation of this, because I was looking around and I couldn't find a single other outlet covering this. And it might just be because it's, you know, it's 90s era information, and that is often hard to find. According to this magazine, instead of making it themselves, Midway tried to get Square and Enix to make the new Sub-Zero game. Uh, this game is something that they ended up making themselves and it was a huge mess and it might explain why they tried to go for a more action RPG type game than a typical Mortal Kombat game. I just wonder if this is actually real or if this is something that they made up because I can't find any other source actually talking about this. If anyone knows, please tell me because I am really interested in hearing about this. It would put a lot of things into perspective about that game, like why it exists. Another thing that was really interesting to see was all the early hype for the 64DD. Another thing that we never got. One thing that I didn't know was that they were trying to make a system where you could attach four Game Boys to the 64DD. This is something that they ended up doing for the Nintendo GameCube, where they released the link cables for the GBA and you could play Crystal Chronicles and nothing really else of value. The other thing that was really cool to see that I didn't really know about was the Mario Artist Suite, where they basically gave you a much more enhanced version of Mario Paint from the Super Nintendo, complete with a polygon maker thing. Yeah, I don't know what the fuck this is, but it is interesting to see. Uh, one thing that I didn't know was that this ended up leading to the WarioWare titles because it has a bunch of mini games that have the exact visual representation and audio cues that WarioWare is now known for. It is really cool to see how Nintendo has reused these same concepts to actually make something more coherent and interesting that we actually know and, well, some of it we love to this day. Also, I came across this promotional ad, and is it me, or is Duke Nukem actually shooting the Nintendo 64, damaging it in a stealth jab at the hardware platform? Am I reading too much into this, or is this actually what I'm seeing? After a while, they released this other section that I never really liked seeing. It was basically this weird section where they'd go to kids' rooms and look at all the Nintendo stuff that they had in there, and then give them a, like a bunch of games and some hardware. And I always wondered about this because these kids clearly are spoiled to begin with. They have way too many games already. They have way too much hardware. So why are you giving them like two games and like a rumble pack? when they already have like 50 games. I, I never understood this, like these are spoiled children. Though I guess it's less about the kids getting this and more showing it to other kids and going, look, you could be this cool kid and get free stuff too if you already have all this. It's really, really weird to see. They also had these really weird moments where they would just straight up lie to their audience. In this review for South Park, they lie about how good the expansion pack is by basically putting a blur filter on one of the screenshots to make it look like the game looks worse, and then telling you that if you buy this expansion pack, your games are going to look as good as they do on PC, which is such an obvious lie, but you know, this is just something that they did to push sales for their own hardware. Welcome. Businesses now merge with alien nations. An ancient war is being fought under the sea. The president is about to be cloned. And it's your job to try and save the world. So you've got an important decision to make. What are you going to wear? To work. From the team who brought you GoldenEye for N64, meet Special Agent Joanna Dark in Perfect Dark, where you'll find out that the only person man enough to handle a job like this is a woman. Perfect Dark. Ready 
them for mature. Then on the other hand, a really interesting thing, especially looking back to it, they advertised the fuck out of Pokemon. And you might go, yeah, so Pokemon was stupidly popular. And no, it wasn't. Not yet, at least. Uh, this magazine started running in this style since 1997, and Pokemon didn't really become a big thing until the early 2000s here in Europe. I don't know how it was in the UK, but Pokemon started airing in like late 1999 here in the Netherlands and it didn't blow up until the summer after. So it's really interesting to see all this coverage for Pokemon and them praising it as the next big thing and well, they ended up being incredibly right, though they probably didn't expect it to go as well as it ended up doing. But Pokemon was a slow burn here, and from what I recall hearing, a few games were even delayed here in Europe, just because Pokemon wasn't catching on and they didn't want to release it to a dead audience. Which felt like it sucked, because I... I know what this is, please just release it, we're already getting it this fucking late. I hope you enjoyed this look at this weird magazine that existed for some reason. It was an official magazine endorsed by Nintendo that outright attacked the competition and gave prizes to people for smashing their systems. It was a magazine that essentially sold people on really, really shitty games a lot of the time and then bashed those same games later on. It was a magazine that made fun of you for playing Mario Party on your own because you're a fucking loser. No, really, they did this. And it's the magazine that made me want to play Quest 64, only to realize that it was a piece of shit. Anyway, this was above up. I went through about 30 issues of this goddamn magazine for this video and I am tired right now. I'll see you next video and uh... Yeah, see ya. Deru deru, deru na no dense. Deru 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 deru, tsui ni deru. Goja, kondo no boken. Real, kimi mo sugu ni taiken. Nikui de yansu ne konjiku shou. Goga shitsu no nazo toki action. Tomato u koto naku no meri komo. Mochi no ron super famicom. Go, go, go.